fame and fortune in a rock band. But off stage, he committed the most horrendous crimes involving children. He blurts out, I've got a two-year-old on Tuesday. What do you mean you've got a two-year-old on Tuesday? I've got a two-year-old to rape on Tuesday. Now there are calls for an inquiry. Because of the numbers of children involved, the numbers of forces involved, some kind of large inquiry really needs to happen. For the first time, we can reveal the details behind a second case linked to the same police officer who's under investigation. He could have been stopped a lot sooner, a hell of a lot sooner. Tonight, we examine new evidence and investigate if there were missed opportunities to stop a paedophile. Arriving at court, this is the woman who would help put Ian Watkins behind bars. It doesn't matter how many years he gets, it doesn't matter about his life being taken away because it doesn't give any children. But his lives have been ruined, destroyed. It doesn't give them their lives back. Watkins is driven away to begin a 29-year jail sentence. He admitted carrying out horrific offences with the help of what he called superfans, women who allowed their children to be abused by him. Watkins' offending went unchecked for years, but he was known to the police as long ago as 2008. And we can reveal that social services were also made aware of concerns about him. But he remained a free man, free to carry out the most horrific crimes. Ian David Carslake Watkins was brought up in Pontypridd and went to Hawthorne High School. Let's go back to the beginning and um, tell us a bit about how it happened for you as a band. Does it go back to school? Yeah, we all grew up together, basically. We all like lived within like, a few acres of each other kind of thing, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Watkins studied graphic design and graduated with a first from South Wales University. He got a job as a graphic designer, but he was distracted by his first love, music. We, we'd never really turn down a gig, you know what I mean? We'd play anywhere. If some kid, like, would see us at a gig and he'd say, oh, it's my birthday next week, will you come and play in a garage? And we'd be like, yeah. Tell us about when you went out to America. Music presenter and journalist Bethan Elvin interviewed the band for that TV programme and continued to chart their progress for years. The heavy rock music of the South Wales Valleys became international and largely thanks to the Lost Prophets because they were one of the first bands that signed huge international record deals they signed to managers that the biggest rock bands in the world were looking after. And really, it was so surprising because they came from nowhere. They were just kids. They were school friends. And they were from a small town like Pontypridd that really hadn't seen anything like it before. As the lead singer and frontman of the band, it was Ian Watkins who attracted a lot of the attention. He was great fun and he, he was a funny character. He was, yes, he was charismatic, he was energetic, uh, enthusiastic about what he was doing and just, you know, I suppose loved getting the attention, really. Yeah. The band were real rock stars now and Ian Watkins let the cameras into his home in Pontypridd. Ow! Hard glass. None today. None today. No, today. no, no, I've got four pints here. here just weeks later, Watkins was contacted by a woman who would go on to expose him as a paedophile. Joanne Majelix got in touch with the Lost Prophets star on the internet. normal. Would it be fair to say that he swept you off your feet? Oh yeah, yeah, he did. As I got to know him, I saw him as like the guy that took care of his family, looked after his mum. 
Watkins and Joanne, who was an escort, began a sexual relationship. But later he began to tell her things which made her feel uneasy. It starts off with him saying to me about all these 14-year-old fans that he'd abused and took the virginity of. And he'd also been saying that he wanted to get me pregnant. He wanted to get me pregnant just so that he could abuse the baby. Joanne threatened to report him to the police because she suspected he was abusing a young child. She says Watkins begged her not to, and he got his solicitors to draw up a gagging order against her. He presents you with a document which, in effect, claims that you'd made all this up. That I was a liar. And that you were a liar. Yeah. And, um, and you signed it. At, yeah. I, I was forced to sign it really under duress, but I signed it because I'd sought legal advice as well. Uh, and uh, what advice had you been given? That I could still go to the police, because he was threatening me, saying I couldn't go to the police. He was saying I couldn't even go to the police if I'd signed that. Is it possible that the police have taken a sceptical view of you and your story because of the gagging order, because this document exists, which you signed... I think it's an excuse. ..in which you said, I've made all this up. I think it's an excuse. It's an excuse, because I can't make up a child, can I? Having signed the gagging order, Joanne received £2,000 from Watkins for what she says was services she provided him as an escort. At the end of December 2008, Joanne did go ahead and contact South Wales Police at the Child Protection Unit at Pontypridd Police Station. Joanne says she did more than tell the police about the disturbing things that Watkins had told her. She also says she sent them a copy of this photograph. It shows a young girl of about four years of age who's holding a photo frame with the picture of a scantily clad woman. On top of the frame is a razor blade and a thin line of white powder. In her other hand, the girl is holding a rolled up 20 pound note. It appears to be drugs paraphernalia. And Joanne says Watkins told her the white powder was cocaine. We can't show the picture for legal reasons. Joanne told us, for the first time, that she went to Rhonda Cannon Taft Social Services as well as the police to tell them about the girl in the picture. Did they tell you what action they were taking? Uh, no. See, they, they wouldn't. And this is what was so frustrating for me because I was reporting every single time that I made reports. I was then basically left out of the loop. You know, you've reported it now, we can't discuss this any further, we can't tell you what we've done. You know, and it'd be like, but you need to tell me, is she safe yet or what, you know? But she says she kept going back to social services with continued concerns about the girl. You know, it was repeated calls about the same little girl over time. Every time I knew that my complaints were not going anywhere with the police, I would back it up by getting social services to do something and say, can't you do something about this? David Niven is a leading child protection consultant and a former chairman of the British Association of Social Workers. We showed him the picture, anonymised, of the girl and asked him for his expert opinion. It's, it's totally inappropriate and it's totally wrong and it should be looked into. All I can't tell from a photograph is whether that's really drugs or, or whatever, but the actual staging of it is, um, to my mind, inappropriate for uh, a child. Joanne thought her evidence, the picture of the child, together with her concerns about Watkins, would trigger immediate action by the police. They just kept telling me the same excuse. They haven't decided how to interview me yet. That was the standard excuse that they were using at that time. And I'm saying to them, but you need to get her out of his way. You need to get her out of danger. In April 2009, three months after she first reported Watkins to police in Pontypridd, she was visited at her home in Yorkshire by an officer who took a video statement. A month later, she says a detective sergeant from South Wales Police told her they weren't going to investigate any further. And did he give you any explanation? Not enough evidence. And I said, but it is happening. And I said, if anything happens to another child, it's on your head, not mine, because I know that he will continue. What would normally happen would be um, that the police would uh, talk to social services, who've got a lead in, in, in that field, 
and social services would convene a strategy meeting that would involve the key people um, that they were aware of in that child's life. That's the whole point, is making collective, collaborative decisions about a situation. Rundha Kanantaf Social Services says it did take action in line with agreed procedures following Joanne's report to them in December 2008. It's 2009 and the lost profits are regularly headlining huge rock festivals in this country and abroad. Earlier in his career, Watkins had shunned drink and drugs and was what's called straight-edged. But now his behaviour was beginning to worry those around him. We've spoken to a close friend of Watkins who told us of her concerns. She doesn't wish to be identified. more important than anything. We all tried to help him. He was an extremist. He was completely straight-edged. And then he just turned into a complete junkie. The band were spending a lot of time in Los Angeles recording their music. He was constantly off his face. He wouldn't shower for days. His apartment was a complete wreck. Fast forward to the beginning of 2010, and the band come home. They performed at Hawthorne High in Pontypridd, where a number of the band members went to school, including Ian Watkins. They were supporting a Welsh government campaign to promote the Valleys. A few months later, Joanne gets back in touch with Watkins, believing she must have been wrong about him, and she apologises. I thought, maybe I did get it wrong. Maybe I did, because, you know, the, the police didn't do anything about it, and he was saying all along that it was just coke talk and it wasn't real. So maybe I did get it wrong. So I contact him, and I say to him, oh, I'm sorry that I reported you. I must have got it wrong because the police didn't do anything. A couple of weeks later, they meet up at a hotel in Leeds, and Joanne is horrified by a video on his laptop, which he says shows a young girl being raped. He sat there and he's just staring at me. With that this evil smirk on his face. Because he wanted a reaction. And uh, I could just feel the tears. And I'm, I'm thinking at the same time. Oh my God, I wasn't wrong about him. I wasn't wrong about him. And at the same time in the head, I'm thinking, I've got to report him again, but I can't report him again because what am I gonna say? He's got this video on his laptop. He's just gonna hide the laptop like he hid everything else the last time. Joanne says she threw him out of the hotel and despite her grave concerns, didn't feel able to go to the police again at this stage because she didn't think they would believe her. In October 2010, South Wales Police received information from the Metropolitan Police detailing allegations against Watkins. But significantly, the complaint wasn't made by Joanne Majelix. We don't know who the complainant was or what action was taken. Nine months later, Watkins is back recording in Los Angeles. They started telling me about this um five-year-old girl that he's been raping on a regular basis in Los Angeles and I asked him whose child it was and he said oh she's just some obsessed junky mum and that's the first time he'd ever mentioned like using a fan's child. Watkins sent three indecent images to her Blackberry phone. A shocked Joanne got back in touch with South Wales Police with fresh concerns. She was referred back to the same child protection unit at Pontypridd Police Station and the same detective sergeant. He said, oh, oh, oh and he wants you to, it's in Los Angeles, did you say? And I said, yeah. And um, it was like he just, I could tell in his voice that 
he couldn't be asked. basically. He just... Or that he didn't believe you. Yeah, but I'm telling him that I've got the pictures and was I'm telling that, him that I needed he... someone to come and look. Was it that he just didn't believe you? Maybe, maybe he thought, but how would I make that up? Fearing that her various concerns about Watkins aren't being followed up, Joanne turns to the father of the little girl in the picture, and she's shocked to discover that he knows nothing about the photograph involving his daughter. He called me late one Saturday night, and I said to him, were you aware of a complaint I'd made against Ian? And he said, no. And I said, well, I did in 2008. And I said, that's strange because um, I made Child Services promised me that they would speak to you and they said, oh yeah, in all cases, we have to speak to both parents. We've spoken to the child's father and he's confirmed that he did report the matter to South Wales Police. But he says he was told not to pursue it anymore because it could ruin Ian's career. The father also asked what social services had done and he was told that they'd looked into the allegations and that they were satisfied his daughter was safe. It's now March 2012 and events begin to move quickly. Watkins' offending appears to be getting worse, but despite warnings to South Wales police, he's able to carry on abusing children unchecked. Joanne is in contact with a woman on Twitter who in turn knows Watkins. Joanne is concerned that Watkins may have access to the woman's young child. We exchange a few emails and then we exchange phone numbers and she calls me and I tell her that I'm, I'm wanting to make an appointment to go and see the police to make a statement again and to give them my laptop. And I said, have you got anything? And she said, well, yeah, um, he's told me that he wants to put GHB in his sippy cup and on his dummy and rape him. Joanne agrees with the woman to visit her local police station at Doncaster a few days later. But she fails to turn up. She's totally obsessed. attempt to rape her baby boy. They even video the horrific offence. She will eventually be caught along with Watkins and jailed, but not yet. Thank you guys, everybody get home safely. Thank you so much. That very same night, Watkins had been at a party promoting the band's new album. The next day, he was doing media interviews. There's a special kind of cachet, if you like, about celebrity abusers. We've had it with Gary Glitter, we've had it with Jonathan King, we've, had, we, we've seen it with Jimmy Savile, whatever. Because the abuse of children essentially is the abuse of power as much as sexual abuse. I mean, and if you give somebody almost unlimited power and they are inclined to um, abuse children, then you're putting together a toxic formula. And that essentially is probably what happened with Watkins. While she says she wasn't aware of his offending, Watkins friend was increasingly worried about his behaviour. The record company gave him an intervention. The band and the management sat him down. And in April 2012, he was the worst he'd ever been. The band was so close to breaking up because he was so awful. They tried really hard. He was never doing anything, but he couldn't be watched 24 hours a day. At this time, Essex Police contacted detectives in South Wales and passed on further information and further allegations about Watkins. These new concerns followed the reports by Joanne, the father of the girl in the photograph, and the Metropolitan Police. The cause for suspicion appeared to be growing. 
At about this time, a separate case involving the detective sergeant at the heart of the Watkins case emerges. That same officer is being investigated over an allegation that he may not have acted on a report of the alleged rape of a 15-year-old girl. We can reveal that this is the accused man in that case, Simon Ashman. He was not convicted of raping the teenager, but in October last year, he was jailed for eight years for separate sexual and violent offences. He denied raping the 15-year-old, but months after the allegation, he went on to indecently assault a five-year-old girl. The little girl's mother wants to know if the attack could have been prevented. The jury at Merthyr Crown Court was read a victim impact statement by the girl's mother. My daughter has nightmares where she feels she's being chased. She's woken up in hot sweats. It takes a long time to calm her. My daughter tries to sleep in my bed and doesn't want to let me go, even in the toilet or other rooms in the house. And I'm heartbroken because of the change in my beautiful girl. A little girl who's been tarnished. We've spoken to a woman who knew Ashman well, and she says he'd been known to South Wales Police for years. Quite often he'd have young girls in his house, and the police knew this. So I don't, I don't know why they couldn't investigate it a lot more. I think if they... He could have been stopped a lot sooner, a hell of a lot sooner. What more do you think could have been done to stop Ashman? I think if they did look into things a bit more, and spoke to a lot more people, and more people were told about him, maybe something could have been done about it. The police watchdog, the IPCC, is continuing to investigate a detective sergeant at Pontypridd Police Station who was involved in the Ashman case. The same sergeant who's also under investigation over Watkins. On September the 21st, 2012, nearly four years after concerns were first brought to the attention of South Wales Police, Watkins was arrested for possession of drugs after they received new information. Importantly, the police also seized his computer, which was heavily encrypted. It was later found to contain damning evidence. Watkins is bailed and gets back in touch with Joanne. She agrees to meet him, she says, so she can try to gather more evidence. I wanted him to keep confessing these things so that I could keep contacting the police and keep pressuring them to arrest him. And he'd be like, I can't believe, every time he'd be like, I can't believe I'm seeing you, I can't believe I keep wanting to see you when you keep trying to put me in jail, repeating the same thing. Watkins arrives at a hotel in London in the early hours of the morning. The first thing he says to me, he blurts out, I've got a two-year-old to rape on Tuesday. Like, showing off about it. Who's two-year-old? What two-year-old? Oh, she's a super fan. What the hell's a super fan? Oh, you know. It's like, you do know I'm a big deal, don't you? And I've got all these um, super fans and they're giving me their kids. Joanne sees an email to Watkins from a woman who she recognises. She realises that the young woman has a child and she fears it's the child Watkins wants to abuse. She then contacts the woman on Twitter and challenges her over the claims. She also gets... I contacted Bedfordshire Child Services and then I contacted Bedford Police and I spoke to someone in Child Protection Unit and I'm basically telling her everything that I'd... going over everything that I'd already told the police in Wales and South Yorkshire, like, a lot of stuff I'm telling her. And I'm saying to her, you've got to do something. The woman with a child Watkins says he plans to rape is Woman B, and she will eventually be arrested and jailed. About three weeks later, Watkins is arrested for a second time at his home address in Pontypridd on suspicion of producing an obscene article. He's granted bail again, and he teams up with the Lost Profits as they embark on a UK tour. This is the last time Watkins would be seen performing on stage at their final concert in Newport on November the 14th, 
2012. A month later, on December the 17th, Watkins is arrested for a third time. Now there's enough evidence and he's charged, together with women A and B, with a series of sex offences. For nearly a year he protests his innocence, but finally, last November, he admitted he was responsible for a catalogue of sex offending involving children. Watkins was sentenced to 29 years in jail and must serve an additional six years on licence. Woman A was sentenced to 14 years, woman B, 17 years. Today's sentence reflects the gravity of the crimes that have been committed. The three paedophiles responsible for the terrible abuse of two babies have now been brought to justice. Watkins has since lodged an appeal against his 29-year sentence. The story doesn't end here. While phase one of the investigation is complete, phase two is still very much ongoing. It aims to establish if there are any more victims or offenders linked to Watkins or his associates. Police inquiries continue in Germany, the USA and here in the UK. But questions still remain unanswered, such as what action, if any, was taken by South Wales Police each time Joanne Majelix made a complaint against Watkins? What happened to the reports from other complainants? And perhaps most significantly, could Watkins' offending have been stopped earlier if the police had taken a different course of action? These questions and more still need to be answered, and tonight there are growing calls for a wide-scale investigation because of the numbers of children involved, the numbers of forces involved, the numbers of professional people involved in the whole decision-making and information-sharing um, uh, network, if you like, um, that some kind of um, large inquiry really needs to happen that will um, be transparent and be educative for the rest of professionals up and down Wales and England, who actually are doing this day to day. Joanne was arrested over a sex tape with Watkins, but she says the police took no further action. South Wales Police have identified their own concerns and they say they have strengthened child protection procedures and they've called in the Independent Police Complaints Commission to investigate. The IPCC isn't expected to publish its findings for months, but the detective sergeant at the heart of this case has been served notice that he's under investigation for gross misconduct. The IPCC is also looking at the way he was managed by his superiors, and it's investigating two other police forces in Bedfordshire and South Yorkshire. Bedfordshire police say they did investigate woman B in October 2012. They found no evidence of child abuse at the time, but did forward information to South Wales Police. South Yorkshire confirmed information was supplied to them on three separate occasions, but declined to comment further. Joanne's story is now being listened to. She's been interviewed by the IPCC and the police. At the end of the interview, they said, Joanne, we've already arrested Ian. And I just broke down and cried and I just said, you're four years too late, you are four years too late. I think he was a different person to everyone. He showed people what he wanted them to see. If they'd listened to you right at the beginning, what difference do you think you could have made? Well, there's uh, hundreds of kids out there whose life wouldn't have been ruined. Police have got a lot to answer for for that.